Okay, uh, g'day everyone. Um, welcome to the Forbidden History Chronicles. You're here with Ninja Cat 111 and Desert Owl from the Forbidden History series. Thank you, Lynn, for the sound check. Um, hi, your love. <laughs> um, can you guys just let me know if you got a notification? Because I know they haven't been working very well, and it would be fantastic to um, hear that they actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, that'd be nice change okay we'll just get straight into it I'll just read Desert's introduction um, I also have uh, some questions um, yeah so that's good I'm, I'm prepared kind of um, okay signs of the times in essence Desert discusses the history of the world and how the unseen hand has been running it from the very beginning of time who they are and how they have founded all of the first great civilizations that are found all around the world, about who the giants really were, the ancient Aryan caste and slave systems, the priesthoods, the anti-gravity v manners, the earth-based misnomer UFOs which are man-made, the control of all forms of communications, commerce, religion, mass media, pseudo-politics, etc. It is a grand deception that is used to control all of mankind and all instituted through the three main religions of the world in particular, used as their grand cover. Their cyber code has been revealed to him because he has become adept within the study of the ancient alphabets, communications, symbolism, religion, custom, law, cosmology and mythology, not to mention the fallacy of today's political science and pseudoscience in particular. He can also define the true nature of their warfare, their shell game of bringing one civilization up for their temporary use and then taking it down for the next 500 year generational cycle, as symbolized by the classical Phoenix. Desert discusses the ultimate in mind control and ancient art and the financial control the secret societies and their blood occult rituals and how they wage all wars throughout all time through the nations that they have created which are all imaginations plantations and mere corporations they have taken blood oaths to surrender their self-will and mind to their blind goddess who has demanded our blood from the very beginning of time they communicate to their minions through the movies tv and print media while he can see read and interpret most all of it it all says that they are using us for our ingenuity, for our collective constructive labour, for experimentation, and in the end, they intend to kill us all. They have given us full notice of what they are doing and what they fully intend to do, while all of the general population, the sheeple, they merely go there to be entertained. The new world order is the old world order from the beginning of time. There is a major cosmic natural disaster that is about to happen on Earth, and they know it but they are cleverly leaving us in the dark, hence the reason that they have built hundreds of underground bases all around the world, while they are leaving all of the people to remain unprepared, uninformed and above ground, so that when it comes, the mere 5% who will survive above ground will die from the weaknesses and disease that has been generated from all of the poisons that they have been feeding us. I know this is true because I'm suffering from uh, inhaling some of that the last few days. Um, from the chemicals to fluoride in the water, to tainted vaccines, to fake food, etc, etc. They have enslaved us all by the clever means of deception because we most all are their cattle chattel property and because they merely wanted to harness our labour, what they always needed which is what backs most of the world's currency through the birth certificate but they are all through with us now. It is written in stone as it can be seen written in the Georgia Guidestones. To know the truth is to be empowered and to be prepared. We may not be able to stop what has been done and what is about to happen, but the innocent and decent people on planet Earth deserve to know. And that was written by Desert Owl from the Forbidden History series YouTube channel. Please go check it out. Um, the link's in the description. Please subscribe. Uh, and go back to June 21st, 2018, last year, and start from the beginning. Um, you can contact, my email's in the description, you can contact me to get some free PDFs, uh, and or make a donation to help with the transliteration project. Uh, all the information is in the description. 
Um, so you can see and read it for yourself when you go back and listen. Uh, currently, Desert is also uh, on a new channel um, produced by uh, our Yo engineer, Yo Shelly G. Uh, the f uh, just um, I almost put the in front of it. Uh, Forbidden History Live. That's what it's called. Uh, links in the description. Um, please subscribe and check the bell. It is fantastic. Um, anyway, I'd like to welcome Desert Owl. G'day, Desert. How's it going? Hi, Ninja. Doing okay. Um, did, did my morning read today, and I uh, transcend the universe by hitting the books every morning. That's how I start my day. And uh, most people are eating earth, earth food, but I eat the cosmic food uh, first. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and it's... Uh, it, that's cool. It's food that, it, um, we may want to call it, uh, use the cliche, the breakfast of champions, because it uh, um, it allows one to uh, see beyond, be, beyond uh, the illusory world. We have to, um, you know, have something to, to give us inspiration to, um, to see beyond this world, because people only see the world, and that's all they uh, can relate to. And uh, other than they look up at the stars, but they, but none of these things have any um, deep, deep. Uh, yeah, um, it's all looking organic, at yeah or, organic symbolism. Yeah, uh, for them to to realize what all of these pictures and symbols mean within nature. Uh, forget the the matrix that man has created, but the matrix of nature. Yeah, um, is a is a higher attic of. Um, uh, formula uh, and also communication, uh, but uh, a system of uh, evolution. And um, I know uh, immediately the mainstream Christians get excited when they hear words like that because they don't get the picture. But uh, everything has evolved uh, in the creation process. It wasn't a six 24 hour uh, periods that um, literally all things came to be, but they were the great periods. They were six great periods. Uh, we could reckon them on average about a billion years each, uh, which um, it's acknowledged that uh, looking at all the evidence that the universe is, is at least that old easily. Um, uh, can I ask a question? Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, referring to um, the Bibles of today, um, it's said that uh, time as we know it um, doesn't really exist uh, when it comes to um, creation and 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 our our father. Um, I, I don't know how to put it. Um, like he sees everything at once, past, present, future. So when you when you talk about like six billion years that wouldn't progress as six billion years for our creator is that right or um, well then we're talking <laughs> about when when um the first atom was formed in the void of the universe and then uh, and then the, it uh it you know it grew from there the duplicate of um the atom that was just uh smallest is actually the most powerful, the atom, because the atom is the foundation of everything, therefore the atom is the most powerful. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I was going to answer uh, your question now. It's, uh, okay, so we're, we're in a duality, and um, as we talk about it, yeah. and so we, we see that we have a day and a night. We have a sun and a moon. And so, so the people in the... Um, on the on the lower plane, uh, their their reckoning time uh, by of course the, the systems of nature, the, the the spinning of the earth and the days of, of the sun, and then of course uh, the moon. And I was going to do a read on the moon actually first because I didn't get to do my one read, uh, and I and I thought it'd be a good one to uh, to do here today because it it, it takes us back to this archaic uh, uh, conceptualization that I. Um, you know, was opening with, and so, so when in the duality, just like there's the higher garden, that's the garden of the atoms, uh, falsely called Eden, 
that's the corruption. It's the atom, and the atom is the light. It's the great atom. The great atom is a reflection of the of the of the minuscule, the, um, the, my, the macro. Uh, in it, it, the sun, the macrocosm of the sun is a symbol for the the, the, of the invisible atom, because what the sun is continually shining down upon us are are cosmic atoms that continually uh, come down and, and generate life on Earth. Without them, the, uh, all, everything would be dead. And um, so, so we're, we're in the illusion of time based on the cycles of sun, Earth, and moon and, um, and the rotations. But then at the same time, we're in eternity. We're, we're in a day without end. There will be no end to um, this existence. The only thing that changes is our consciousness of it, and especially if we go to the grave, uh, we're, we're hardly conscious of it anymore, uh, at least time, but maybe maybe eternity wherever uh, one uh, or the other will go once they leave this realm of time, which is the illusion, because uh, time is based on observation of cosmic of cosmic order. Um, so, so did that help answer your question? Kind of. Um, so, so... Yeah, I'm aw- I'm aware that um, time is part of this reality. Um, so that uh, just made made me think of um, all the all the motivational uh, speaking and all that sort of thing. Um, always uh, they always say to us. Um, focus on the present um the present moment so is that kind of a way to comprehend um what it what it will be like uh once we transcend Uh and leave this world it'll be just one constant i'm sorry sorry yeah like it'll i'm just kind of trying to get wrap my head around it um it'll be like one constant uh present beautiful moment um outside of time is kind of the best way i can put it <laughs> well we're, we're dealing with uh the, the people well, as we see people live in the past or they or they're they're, they're worried about the future they're, yeah or they're always about something's gonna happen they when whenever their big yeah. you know payday cashes in whatever their you know future uh you know, some of us, for some it's dread, for some it's anticipation of something great, um, and they're, uh, but it's of the world, you know, it's yeah. of the world that yeah. they're chasing, they're chasing the rainbow and the pot of gold, and, and uh, you know, just like uh, they, they, uh, they make it seem, try to make it seem exciting about the, you know, the silver uh, anniversary and the golden anniversary, you know, or, or golden years of uh, old age, you know, like um, uh, to, 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 to play on the deception of, uh, this is all there is, you yeah. know. So, um, so they're, they're um, so to live in the present moment is 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 the only thing we have because we don't have a future. Uh, the future is not here yet, and the and the past is is already gone. So, yeah. so things we can't not change the past. So that we can we can uh, uh, affect our future by our experiences of the past, and we can. Uh, uh, but we have to be in the present moment because this is. What, um, in other words, we're taken very often taken by surprise with things that confront us, and, and when we're, we're not focused and in the present moment, and, and uh, as a spiritual being, uh, looking for uh, potential disruptions to then be immediately be able to to recognize them and to uh, deal with them is is important in the spiritual walk. So so to um, to uh, uh, you know be be. Uh, you know, out of, out of that focus, it, it, and that's, that would be the word. It's a focusing, you know, just like with a, with a magnifying glass or with, or with the uh, binoculars, we're focusing on the present moment because this is what, where it's at, you know, our interaction right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, um, and the discussion that is going on, and, uh, and it will uh, enhance the future uh, to be focused uh, on the, uh, the things that are most important where, in the, in the present moment, um, most people, and we, you know, might be fair to guess, are engaged in things that are not so important, whether it's uh, sports or uh, other forms of entertainment or luxuries, you know, all of these things that um, are the diversion.
flourishing because they're going somewhere, whether they like it or not, and where they're going is to the grave. They have a temporary existence in this universe, in this world, and unless they can get focused in the present moment as to who they are, where they are, why they are, and when they are, then they're, um, they're going to miss the mark and the opportunity to have transformed themselves into the likeness of the great breath of the wind and fire, the Holy, what we call the Holy Spirit. Uh, and um, so, so it's to identify with who we really are and then to transcend uh, this world. That's, that's really all we have. Anything else is an illusion. We didn't take anything into the world other than our, our spirit and, uh, and, the bat, and, the, and the body is the house, the serpent is the house of our body. And then we, uh, we leave everything behind. We take nothing with us. So, so to, to use our entire uh, energy and the short time we have here to acquire material things uh, is the grand deception because what we want to acquire is what uh, we, we can put within. And so that's the treasure in heaven. That's known as the treasures in heaven. And so what I, have, uh, which more correctly are the treasures of the soul, and the treasures of the soul, soul being synonymous with the sun, the light, the soul, the soul of light is our, our, our uh, you know, who we really are inside. This uh, that keeps our body ticking because if our soul left uh, the, you know, the body, then then the body would die. So the same with the soul being the sun of the solar system. If it left, all the planets and their activity would would immediately cease. Wow. And the rotation, yeah. So so it's all a mystery. It's cosmic and. Um, and, but uh, yet we have to define all things within our universe because all things can be defined. That's the way it was designed, you see. We are yeah, a yeah. reflection of it within our own cosmic nature. Go ahead. Oh, I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah, I can see. I can see. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, all right, so I, I got a book uh, that um, is called The uh, Lectures on the Science of Language by Max Muller from the uh, 1800s, an absolute scholar from Oxford, he went ended up going to Oxford, and he's expert on the ancient forms of communication, and so he had an interesting um, bit in here about uh, what's in his introduction, basically. Well, no, this is his first lecture, I read the introduction, uh, and so I'm just uh, getting into it, and it just was about moon and time, and I thought this would be good uh, to see, because we have to see how other people saw things. In other words, yeah. what I, I've been talking about on the on all my broadcasts with the what's called the original thought. And we, we don't see or think or process or associate in any way, shape, or form like the, the ancients did. They were on the other side of the brain, and they, uh, it was all uh, reflective of nature based on symbol, metaphor, and, um, and, uh, and the nature was the reference point to the idea. Just like uh, the word idea itself, as it was discovered on the walls of a Hittite, uh, uh, sanctuary temple there in uh, uh, you know what's today Turkey uh, uh, would have been like north uh, northeastern Turkey um, the Hittite civilization that was discovered there big time in the 1800s uh, on the side of the, the wall one of the walls it has a picture of an eye and then it has a picture uh, next to it of a deer with antlers and so we could appreciate wow. that. Wow! It means, it means to go looking. It means to go looking yeah. on the hunt, right? It's yeah. The eye and the deer. But but that's where we get the word idea from. Yeah. Because we're looking for something, right? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. In 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 these days, um, yeah, you you're right. We look at things from complete opposite perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Or that's where it says that people perish for a lack of uh, uh, knowledge or where there is no vision. The ability to interpret what is right before them uh, by uh, virtue of uh, everything is a symbol. And how can, the, how can the great spirit communicate with you if you don't know the meaning of anything? You know? Yeah. And, and so that's where we have to put on these, uh, these uh, uh, ancient truths. So here... Uh, I'll move into it here. Okay, so I'll just start up at the top of the page, working down to my highlights. The science, he starts out with the science of plants, would uh, have been called uh, photology, of, of phytology, phyto, uh, yeah, phyto, uh, phytology, and from the Greek phyton, a plant. And the founders of astronomy 
were not the poet or the philosopher, but the sailor and the farmer. Okay? The early poet may have admitted the many dance of the planets, the Maisie dance of the planets, and the philosopher may have speculated on the heaven, heavenly harmonies, but it was the sailor alone that a knowledge of the glittering guides of the sky, of the night sky, became a question of life and death. And this is what, where we talk about the word navigator, right, as being the original word for prophet, the star navigator or soul navigator. It was he who calculated their rising and settings with the accuracy of a merchant and the shrewdness of an adventurer. And the names that were given to the single stars or constellations clearly show that they were invented by the plowers of the sea and of the land. So you're pushing your V cutting, that's the, uh, uh, the V, is the, uh, the driving, that's where the word driving comes from, it means driving, because once you got the bigger boats, they were, they were no longer getting wet all the time, and they were driving, because they were now, had their cargo was nice and protected and dry with the bigger boats, and they were cutting the waters in the V, so that's driving, and, um, and it's interesting that here it's referred to as plowing, you know, plowers of the sea and of the land. Because they all they all worked, of course, with the timelines of the of the sun, earth, yeah. moon, stars. They knew, you know, they had to plant yeah. their plant uh, during the, a certain phase of the moon, whether it was a full moon or a new moon. I can't remember, you know. But I've heard these things that yeah, are same. Same clearly evident. Yeah. That if you don't plant your seed during the right cycle of the moon, you're not going to have as good a harvest. So exactly. That, that is relevant. Yeah. And um, so the moon, for instance, the golden hand on the dark dial of heaven, of the sky, the moon, for instance, the golden hand, on the dark dial of the, of the night sky was called the measurer, was called by them the measurer, the measurer of time, for time was measured by nights, and moons, and winters, long before it was reckoned by days, and suns, and years, so we can, we can appreciate that, because, like, we know how, um, in Native American culture, which I grew up with being exposed to, um, you know, the, the traditional Native would always say, in three moons, you know, in three moons. So, so the only way to reckon, to reckon a month clearly was by the moon. That's why the month, month is called month, moon, moon, because uh, there's no other way to reckon a month other than by the cycles of a moon. So it was the predominant uh, measurer, and then they realized that the, that 13 moons is, is basically years. It's um, off uh, by uh, f uh, five days, I believe. Um, that's where they found the mean time between sun and moon. One was 300 or 255 days, and the, and the other one, I think the sun may have been 255 days in, uh, or the moon, and then the other was uh, 300 and, uh, 305, 305 days. So between those two is the mean 360. And so that's the midpoint between the difference between the, the uh, cycles of the sun and moon within a year. Um, and um, wow. <laughs> and, yeah. And so, so, uh, so, the, the, so the moon, of course, uh, uh, you know, was was uh, bearing had bearing then for you know for the lunar, of course, and that's so that's where the the calendar, you know, the counting of time started with the moon, obviously, and um, they would have seen it as the the the, the um, the hallmark of the Ancient of Days, because looking at the moon is like looking at a, a mountain. That's where the word mountain comes from, moon 10, moon 10, meaning meaning both your hands up there to grab it, or, you know, what is that, the highest, the, the moon 10 is the, uh, the mountain. And uh, um, so uh, and then we see the two O's in there, of course, is the uh, symbol of sun and moon, because the light, the, the moon is the reflection of the sun, the light. And then the M is the mother, the Mo is the mother, and then the uh, On is one. And so it's the mother is one in the metaphor of that symbolism. And then the, the it would have really have two ends on it. And so the M is split on the other end. It's M-O-O-N-N, -N, uh, because the M is really two ends uh, split. And uh, so there, there's a lot going on there. Then the word harvest is then found in these prime symbols in the and then we see also the word noon is there as well um, you know so a lot is going on with these primitive uh, 
of symbols. So I'll, I'll read on, continue here. Um, moon, oh, and then the foot, there's a footnote first on moon. Moon on this next paragraph. Uh, okay, so uh, in the Edda, the moon, is, and this, the Edda, I think it was something that came out of the Gothic uh, tradition. Um, the Edda, the moon is called uh, the year teller. It says uh, Artali. Uh, there's the word tally, tally for counting, the artali. There's R for plowing, okay? So it means the, the counting of the plow in, a, in another, or, or the counting of numbers, the, pow, uh, the plowing of numbers, excuse me. The plowing, there's numbers is artali, but yet it means here, as he's implying it, year teller. Basically, it would be the same thing, right? The, the uh, plowing of the, of the tally. Uh, so uh, a bach named for moon, is uh, argi is is ari, uh, meaning also light measure, and so these are two different aspects of it. And so moon is a very old word. It was mona. In fact, we all this is where we also get the word mana from. I was just you know, about to say that, but I didn't want to interrupt. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, and it has to do with the mental and of the mind. Wow. Uh, as we talked yesterday yeah. Yeah. On uh, uh, Forbidden History Live. Um, uh, when we did the program last night, you know that uh, that the, the, the mana is really was merely symbolic of of the harvesting of the mind of our thoughts of of our the ability to read these things. Yeah. It was mona. Interesting. That's where we find Mona Lisa as well. Oh. It was mona <laughs> in Anglo-Saxon and uh, was used there not as a feminine but as a masculine. And the, and, and and all. Sun, Earth, and Moon have both masculine and feminine. It depends upon what aspect you're talking about. Um, so just like we can talk about the Sun represents the Great Spirit or represents Yeshua, masculine, it also represents the Virgin Light, Mary, the Virgin Light that comes down. And and, um, and then the uh, Behor would be the, the Moon. But also the Moon, the softer light, represents Yeshua in that we can look at him. We can't look at Yahweh because he's so powerful like the Sun. We can't look at the sun, but we can look at the moon. So depending upon the metaphor and the story, you can be talking about any one or the other, okay? So that's how that works. So uh, so for the moon was originally uh, a masculine and the sun a feminine. And in all the Teutonic uh, languages, uh, for it, it is only through the influence of classical models that the English moon has been changed into the, a feminine and, and sun into a masculine. It was a most unlikely assertion which Mr. Harris made in his Hermes that uh, all nations ascribe to the sun a masculine and to the moon a feminine gender. And of course, it is Lucifer to the occultist. In the mythology of the Edda, many the moon is the sun, S-O-N, and then soul, S-O-L, the sun. So it's claiming here that the sun, S-O-N, is also the sun, S-U-N. Of course it is. That's what they're saying when they had a boy. They said, I had a sun. I have a star. I have the inheritor of the estate. I have the power, the power uh, guy right here, not not the, the, the girl, which is the weaker, you know, and doesn't bring uh, pass on the inheritance. Um, uh, 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 by rule, there are exceptions, of course, and there were also in the Shariul. Okay, so the daughter of the Monday Fore, uh, that's that's what I mean. Let me try that again. So, uh, in mythology, the Edda Mani, the moon, is the sun, S O L, the sun, S U N, S O N, the daughter of Monday, uh, Monday Fore. In the uh, uh, in the Gothic Mena. The moon is masculine, sono, the sun, feminine, and Anglo-Saxon too, mona, the moon, uh, constitute, uh, continues to be used as a masculine. Sun, S-U-N-N-E, is the feminine uh, with Chaucer. In uh, Swedish, that's Middle English, of course, sun, S-U-N-N-E. In Swedish, many, the moon, is masculine, sol, S-O-L, the Sun, S-U-N, feminine. The Lithuanians also give the masculine gender to the moon, the menu, the feminine gender to the sun, solu, uh, solu. Uh, and in the 
Sanskrit, through the sun, is ordinarily looked upon as a male power, the most current name for the moon, such as Kendra, Soma, Hindu, Vidu. Soma is also a drink. Yes. <laughs> Soma implies the drink of the sun, are masculine. Wow. Uh, the names of... Uh, mm, sorry? Just wowing. Sorry. Please continue. Uh, yeah. The, the names of the moon are frequently used in the sense of month, and these and other names for month retain the same gender. Thus, men, Menos, the Gothic, uh, Monda, uh, Mon, uh, Monad, Monad, it's the TH instead of the TH, Monad, in Anglo Saxon, uh, are both masculine. In Greek, we find men, M E N, and the uh, iconic Menos. For month, well, there's the word menace. He's a menace. He's a he's in the darkness of the moon, a lunatic perhaps. Always used in the masculine gender. In Latin, we have the derivative mensis, month. And well, then then that makes me think of that uh, higher intellectual organization called mensis. Mensis, right? I don't know, is that what they call it? Mensis. You take a test. You go, you show you had a higher IQ than most everybody else. You join the club. Month. Uh, and in Sanskrit, we find mas for moon and masa for month, both masculine. And I'll just see where this, is, this next paragraph is going. Now, this uh, mas in Sanskrit is clearly, clearly derived from the root ma, to measure, to meet. So ma, there, therefore, uh, is, um, of course, and that's where we get uh, what um, uh, the metric, the metric system is derived from that sense also, uh, and to meet, there's meter to meet. In Sanskrit, I measure is ma me. I measure, ma me. Um, and uh, thou, thou measurest. Um, and so that's the first calculation I get saying, oh, you're my ma me. Okay, ma me, I get it. And thou measurest, ma si, he measures, ma ti, or mini ti, mini ti, mini ti. Uh, an instrument of measuring is called in Sanskrit the matram. Matram. Oh, there, there. Then we get the word mantra. Wow. From that as well. To, to make metron. There's metron for counting time. The, the metron goes back and forth. Da, 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 da. You can speed it up by lowering the weight, right? Metron. Yeah. Metric. Power, metric meet. system. Metric. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, if the moon was originally called by the farmer, uh, farmer, uh, the measurer. The ruler of days, weeks, and seasons, the regulator of tides, the, the, the lord, which would be sunrise, of their festivals, and the herald of their public assemblies, it is but natural that he should have been conceived as a man and not, there's the word moon again, man is the seat of the moon, man, uh, and not as the lovesick maiden with our modern sentimental poetry has put in its place. It was the sailor who before... Oh, wait a minute, there was a footnote over here. I just got to see this. Uh, oh, it's, it's all in... It looks like German. Okay, <laughs> so it was the sailor who, before entrusting his life and goods to the winds and the waves of the ocean, watched for the rising of those stars, which he called the sailing stars, or the Pleiades. And uh, footnote on that is... Uh, In the ocean, uh, in the Oskan inscription of the Agnon, we find a Jupiter Vigarius, a name which Professor Alfred compares with that of Jupiter uh, Viminius, Jupiter who fosters the growth of twigs. And see, however, on Jupiter's uh, Viminius. And he, his altar is near the Porta Vimalius. Okay, so not much going on here. Um, okay, oh, what is this? Uh, and, uh, oh, wait a minute. The Zulus, uh, the Zulus called the Pleiades the Insulamela, the digging stars, the digging stars, because when they appear, the people begin to dig, I guess, to plant their, their crop, okay? Yeah. So it's that time of season. So um, at least it was for that period. Uh, of time, because as we go through the zodiac, of course, those positions change uh, one degree every 72 
years. Um, and so where is that? Uh, where did I leave off here? Um, okay, for uh, from oh, so the sailing stars are Pleiades from Pleiades Pleiades to sail. Navigation in the Greek waters was considered safe after return of the Pleiades, and it it closed when they disappeared. The Latin name for Pleiades is Virga, uh, Virgil, Virgilio, oh, Io, Virgilio, uh, Virgilio from Virga, Virga, or sprout or twig. This name was given to them by the Italian husbandmen because in Italy, where they became visible in about May, they marked the return of summer. Uh, another constellation, the seven heads, stars in Taurus. Well, I think I can leave off there, and I think I got uh, people the idea here of uh, how, uh, you know, they never talked to us about this stuff in school, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's so much. We could go and, on and on and on. I, I love this. I love this part of the this topic. Desert. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so. well, I, want, I want to know where we, uh, you know, where we are in our, um, in our, in our um, again, to um, to be in the present moment is really to transcend time, as we were talking about. And so, yeah. therefore, um, when you're in the present moment. You're, you're, uh, it's, it would be like uh, uh, also associated with the term meditation and uh, media for being centered. Uh, the media is at the center, the medium, and and therefore uh, when we are centered and when we are focused and we are in the present moment, not caught up in the future, not caught up in the past, then we can focus. And by virtue of that focus, it, we can then transcend the universe forward, frontwards, backwards, upside down, inside out. Because, because we are making a connection with the one who is always in the present moment. Who would be in the present moment more than the one who made all things? How can he possibly be focused on every body, every cre- 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 uh, creature? You know, all the stars of the universe all maintained by the one. How can it? How can it be? You know, and so so there's nobody more in the present moment than the one who made all things. And so if he's in the present moment. We should be in the present moment, and that's when things begin to open up for us, and from inward to outward, you know, and uh, but but it, according to its true nature, you see. So this is all great mystery, and uh, yeah. And, wow. Uh, so this, so wow. Where we are. <laughs> our, our yeah. Cosmos. yeah. So uh, so real quick, give me a, a two minute break, uh, and just just so I can rest my throat, and I'll get on with uh, the next uh, segment here. Okay, on interpretation of the scriptures according to uh, the way they really are and not the way they're mis- uh, misinterpreted all the time, okay? And I want to welcome any new listeners to the broadcast right here on the Forbidden History Chronicles on Ninja Cat 111. And I hope you are telling your friends, okay? And we will take calls. I want to tell people how they can contact and call in if they want. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a bit of paper. Okay, um, you can call Desert. Uh, actually, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, we're we're very techy here. Um, you need to if you want to call in. Uh, we do take live calls, um, questions, uh, anything. Um, if you just want to have a chat to Desert, um, see what it's like to uh, be on a live show. Um, sorry, program. Um, uh, we need you to text him first <laughs> so that he can call you back uh, and that's how we can have a group conversation live. Um, so you text him on 608-566-7295. That's 608-566-7295. If you're international, just put a plus one at the start. Uh, you can also Skype him on Free America Radio, all one word. That's Free America Radio. Um, we haven't had a go with uh, Desert um, talking to anyone through Skype yet, so uh, that would be interesting uh, if you want to try that out. Um, Desert's also available for interviews. Um, and you can call him outside of the stream as well um, just to uh, have a chat or if you have any questions um, okay uh, I'll give out the rest of the details while I'm kind of on a roll um, you can also uh, if you want to help with the transliterational project 
um, any size donation is very welcome uh, to help uh, we are not um, nobody pays us to do this <laughs> Um, so yeah, any any help at all uh, is greatly appreciated. Uh, you can uh, donate at www.therealpublicradio.net. That's www.therealpublicradio.net. Uh, you can do it through PayPal there. Um, just hit the donate button. Um, and in doing that, you will receive uh, some PDFs so that you can see and read it for yourself. Um, there's three. Uh, you receive a copy of the Real Da Vinci Code Etymological Dictionary written by Desert Owl. Uh, also a copy of the Book of Wisdom and also a sample of the original gospel uh, with a more up-to-date version of the dictionary at the back of it um, if you can't afford to donate uh, we are quite happy to get you the pdfs anyway um, because uh, they, they they help um, <laughs> they, they help they help you understand um, what desert is sharing with us um, so yeah, uh, my email is in the description on every live stream. Um, if you'd like PDFs, uh, just let me know and I will get them to you. Um, if you donate, um, be sure to uh, pass it on, like let me know that you've donated to Desert and I can get you the PDFs. Um, okay, uh, Desert. Can I play some music as well, or do you want to, or you're right, you're good to go? I'm back. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, just... I'm, I'm going to go through Lamb's uh, his two uh, classics, the uh, Old Testament light, and then we're going to do New Testament light, just a little sample. So here we're in uh, the on firmament out of Genesis, which is correctly Ganesha. Ganesha is the... Uh, Ganesha? Ganesha? Ganesha. Uh, Ganesha. Uh, Ganesha, Ganesha is um, the uh, Genesis is a corruption of the word Ganesha, and Gan is garden, and yeah. uh, and the garden of the royal eye, and so everything is here as we were talking about to be read yeah. and interpreted. But you have to have royal eyes to do that, and, and the only way you have royal eyes is to get focused and to get centered and to um, recognize the true nature of se of self and and all things there therefore around you. So it, this is the lower garden, and yeah. therefore it was designed for us to be able to read it, all the symbolism within it, it and it takes us back home. That's what it does. Okay, so here uh, is the Lamsa is defining certain aspects out of uh, Ganesha, Genesis, and uh, and we're on the word firmament. And so it's interesting that we have a few uh, here that we'll share. we got the time and seasons coming up, and then also division of the sky. So I'll work through those. And that will be appropriate for what we just discussed. So, so firmament and Yom uh, who is the great Lord of Haim, made the firmament, at, uh, which is the, um, the um, basically the envelope. Okay, just to clarify, that is the envelope. That is the ozone layer. That uh, the very thin uh, protection that goes around the Earth that we know now is uh, destroyed uh, for the most part by the uh, geoengineering and uh, and of course all the modern the modern uh, uh, carbon producing uh, industries and, and uh, which we never needed because we always had free energy and never had to destroy our world uh, to, to have this modern civilization but they wanted to keep us on the string of uh, dependency of, uh, of lower forms of energy resource and therefore they could tax us and, and enslave us so uh, uh, free, that's why Tesla never got to do his free energy thing because they, they said wait a minute you mean we can't you know, give it away? What are you talking about? And J.P. Morgan then just shut down his project on Long Island with that first prototype tower he uh, had built. And so, um, so continuing here, so, and the Yamaha, who is the great pool of Haim, made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the, the envelope from the waters which were above the envelope. So the waters above are the cosmic sea, and the waters below are the ocean. So the the vastness of our ocean on this planet has seemed so infinite. Yeah. 
Yeah. But yet it is finite. And, and it is a reflection of the cosmic sea, which is above, which is infinite, you see. And so microcosm, macrocosm, and even the, the microcosm on planet Earth, the lower ocean, is pretty big in comparison yet to the cosmic sea of, of what's above. And it just shows the greatness and infinite nature of, uh, you know, the one who made all things, Yahweh. Wow. And uh, so the Babylonians and the Assyrians knew that the, the, uh, the air uh, below the envelope and the water in the ocean uh, upon the land were uh, of the same essence or nature, uh, or in other words, it was a reflection of the cosmic ocean. They're, they're, uh, it's purely metaphor from that standpoint. The, uh, the waters, in other words, are, uh, the, the sun and the, the earth, right, and the moon, they're all bobbing on the cosmic waters. They're floating. Yeah. You know, they're floating. Yeah. All, everything yeah. is floating. It's yep. Cosmic sea. Yep. Were you trying to jump in? I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just seeing it. It's just wow. Yeah. Um, okay. Just while I'm while I'm, um, while I'm jumping in, um, <laughs> um, just keep keep going. I just have to quickly let the cat in and turn the heater down. All right. Okay. The oh, the water in the firmament is uh, above the firmament, above the envelope is thinner or finer than the heavy water in the ocean. Yeah. Well, that of course the cosmic sea is basically a vacuum. Uh, with uh, but there, you know, there's uh, stuff up there. The uh, the radiation of the sun and the uh, light particles, all of that is in that uh, in that thinner ocean, we could say. But uh, this division is only relevant to the earthly mind and the earthly eye. There is also another division uh, that is of ether and of the air. The Alvarez work. Uh, is always perfect, but difficult to comprehend. But man's quest for knowledge has revealed many of its secrets. This is because man, being like a, a child, uh, a youth uh, of Yahweh, may had made in his image and likeness, has power to analyze and to comprehend all things round about him. Thank you, Lamsa, for giving me a second witness on that. And, um, and everything that's above him. And man's knowledge comes from Yahweh, that is, Yahweh works through him. Okay? And so that was firmament, now we're on vegetation, seeds, and trees. And Yahweh, who is the great Elohim, let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, the zay, and the fruit trees yielding fruit after its kind, whose Day or seed is in itself upon the earth, and it is, it was so, and still is today. That's uh, uh, Ganesha, Genesis 1 11. And the firmament, by the way, was 1 7. I don't know if I mentioned that. And uh, so, continuing here, vegetation, plants, and trees were created before the seeds thereof. The plants and the trees grow and reach um, perfection in order to develop and produce perfect seeds. In other words, plants and trees are more or less finite, but the seed is somewhat infinite. And in fact, that's why the word uh, seed, as in S-E-E-D, is the, the root word zay. And that's the same for the ocean, which we call the sea, S-E-A, uh, as the word seed that is corrupted by the letter D. It's really C. And so the word Sea for the ocean, the word sea for the uh, for the seed, and uh, is the same word. And so when we what they recognized that when you had a handful of seeds, you had a handful of the sea, because when you planted it, it created an ocean on the land, uh, a sea of, of vegetation, you know. And so it was to see with your eyes. The sea uh, with your eyes is the uh, what is before you in the in the sea? So it's the, it's the S E E D, it's the S E A, and it's the S E E. All those are the same word, the Zay. It's the power of plowing, the, the, or the power of the, the vision of the, of the power of the eye. Excuse me. The power of the eye is what Zay means. Like, because you go out, you're not going to go out there and know the ocean without the power of the eye. You never come back. You get lost. You'll die. Or you, or the power of the eye to know that you can plant these. These, these they, 
and put them in the ground and create an ocean on the land. Okay, so that's a, that's the original the Indo-Germanic or the original thought in that terminology. Okay, so uh, very powerful to recognize the primary. You know, and and of course we we sit on a chair and we call it our seat, but it's again it's the they. Why? Because well, man has the seat down there where he's sitting, right? The seat, the they. So that's our seat, our they, and um, that's how it all uh, unfolded, okay, over time. So um, so trees grow in perfection to develop, okay, and um, the little seed, or they, contains all the secrets of the plants and the trees, their color and their design, in a manner that cannot be explained. Then again, the creature, the creative germ in the, in the seeds, or the they, is just as secretive and unknown. Uh, as the creative spark in man. On the other hand, the seed or zay can be kept for a long time and then planted again. Moreover, the seeds or the zay, the zayim, know the secrets of the sun, the water, the soil. The zays, the zayim, uh, knows how to harness the sun's rays and bore into rocks with chemical substances. Yeah. Okay, and then we have times times and seasons, and the great Elohim breathe. Let there be lights in the firmament of the sky to divide the, the Dayel from the night, the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, they sounds, they sounds. That'd be they sounds. There's, a, there's another original thought for seasons, and there's a lot to be said about that. And for days, Dayels and years, the word day, uh, we can see the word Dayel is there. Because it's the sun, earth, the moon going around, right? Wow, does it? Um, sorry, I just got. Uh, I stopped on seasons. Um, I just saw it, sea, and suns. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. And, wow. But, it's, but then we go back to the original. It says they, them, and they, them, they is the seed, and the them is like sand on the beach. It's the infinite without number. Wow. And so the, the infinite seeds, the infinite seeds that keep on coming, the seed, seed sun, right? Yeah, this is amazing, does it? Wow. Wow. I, lo I love, I'm all wowing already. I love it. Um, all right. Do you have I, more? And, <laughs> and, um, and the great little thing breathe, let there be light in the firmament of the sky and to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Genesis. 114. Prior to the creation of the uh, sun, earth, and moon, uh, time was non-existent. Non-existent. Without the creation of the of the sky, of the stars, of the earth, and the sun, and the moon, there would be no events, no periods, no phases of the moon, whereby to reckon time, time and space came into existence during the creation. Obviously, time uh, and and that, that uh, goes back to the uh, this idea of 23, you know, six 24-hour period. Yeah. There wasn't even anything to reckon time with in the beginning when he said, let there be, you know, light. And that was the first uh, aspect of that creation because the earth was not even here in the void. It was, uh, that, that, and the translations are, are wrong. They're all wrong. And that I will share that, um, you know, coming up very soon. I'm getting ready to get back to the project here for at least for the moment. And, uh, so uh, prior to the creation of the sun, earth, and moon, uh, time was non-existent. Without the creation of the sun, earth, and moon, uh, okay, yeah, and time and space came into existence during during creation. Time, days, and years were made by Yahweh, uh, uh, by Yahweh for man's convenience. In Yahweh's eyes, a thousand years are but as yesterday. In one day, with Yahweh is as a thousand years. The psalmist breathes a thousand years in thy sight, but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Psalm 94, 90, uh, verse 4. And that is, Yahweh, being from everlasting to everlasting, is not subject to time and space. The term zadme, or time, here means periods. The term atwata, signs, refers to the stars and planets which stand in the sky 
it like landmarks on the earth. Of course, I, I'm convinced they changed the word here for uh, Zane, signs for Zane, because there we find the word Zayon, Zayon, and, and Zayon, Zion, in the metaphor, uh, it, you know, is, is dealing with all the signs. All the signs are in Zayon, the Zayon, the signs. Signs are signs, you know. It's a play. It's of course the the, the S and the, the Z are also in a, a battle as well within the uh, the letters, just like the uh, the A and the I, uh, you know, or the T and the D. You know, these are the uh, the, the duality and where they're doing switch outs within our ishavors, our words. So um, so uh, signs refer to the stars and planets which stand in the sky like landmarks on the earth. Shana, which probably was correctly, Aishana, year, there, there we go, Aishana, it's a unit of time, the Aramaic word for change is Aishana, or Shana, Aishana, uh, they take the A off the front of these words, because there, there's no A on it, but I know the, the code now, and the abbreviation, the tricks that they did, and they remove the I, the A, which is the I, Aishana denotes the changes from one period or season to another, Biblical day was made up from sunset to sunset. According to Hebrew calendar, a day is the period from one sunset to the next. Undoubtedly, the divisions of time was made after the sun was created, obviously, and its movement studied by Keshan, men. All of Yahweh's work was finished in six days, not seven, the way they did it in all of our, our uh, westernized versions. not mentioned in this account of creation. Weeks and other subdivisions in time were made later. Night watches and hours were not known until days and nights were further divided and our first calendar was instituted. The first mention of a smaller unit of time occurs in the in the uh, Shofar, aka Bible, during the time of King Ahab. It was known as uh, a degree on the sundial, Second Kings 2, 2010. Uh, the term sha, or hour, which should be a sha, hour, first occurred in Daniel 3, 16. I just want to underline this. Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, the word uh, week as in days of the week, uh, in comparison to the other word week, um, as in not strong. Is there a, a word play going on there? Some, somewhere? Uh, that's correct, because, because time is weak, and until we can wow. see eternity, you know. Yeah. yeah, sorry, please continue. <laughs> no, no, you, you, do, you got it, you got it, that's good. Wow. Well, yeah, that, yeah. It's oh. the lower. It's the lower. I mean, what what's stronger, uh, a day without end or days that have to keep re reoccurring? Wow, and yeah, yeah. Wow, repeat. Every it's it's all on repeat. Yeah. Yeah. You see, so so that's how we access eternity by recognizing the truth, and then we realize that the, the time is the illusion because we're already in eternity. In the uh, in the nature of things, that time goes on forever. There's only the only the only 24-hour period is just an illusion of the Earth spinning in a 24-hour period. You know, 24,000 miles have to go go around a thousand miles an hour uh, to re reconstitute a day. But the sun isn't rising; the Earth is spinning. That's why they call it lantern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the go get the land lantern because the land is turning. The lantern. They called it what it was doing. The land was turning. We got to light the land turns. Wow. It's all so simple when you point it out, but we just, we can't see it. We can't see it unless you point it out. It's just, yeah, it, like, it's yeah, amazing. Like to explain that one, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, why they called it a land turn. Those ancients didn't know anything, you know? Yeah, um, that, yeah, yeah they, they, they knew okay, it all. So. They knew it all. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no. and they kept it simple. Like they, they, yeah, they, they said what they saw. They said what they saw all the time. That's yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So seasons were familiar to men from the very beginning, just as they are familiar today to savage tribes and to the illiterate nomads who have little or no knowledge of calendars. They rely on the seasons to mark the passage of time. The sun, moon, and stars were created for six days, or, or excuse me, the sun, moon, and stars were created for days, months, and seasons, but it took man a long time to discover their movements uh, that may, hold on, I guess, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that actually, you know, what I've noticed about uh, Lanza is he's, he's great, but still, um, he has um, things that he states that are, um, you know, based on my learning and my observation and the revelation of Yeshua, that, um, you know, he's not totally correct on, and it's not to his discredit, uh, but um, I have to say that, um, you know, what I know now is, of course, this knowledge was, was breathed into Adam, Adam, had all the knowledge, and that's where it came from. It, it wasn't, to, uh, unless we refer to the ancient, or uh, the, uh, the more primitive peoples, yeah. Then from that standpoint, that's how it came over a period of time. But for the uh, Aishan, for the Aryan, it was breathed into them. And so they, they knew how everything operated in this universe. And that's how we ended up with our modern civilizations, through this knowledge that they had breathed into them, un unlike all the other races that appeared before them, the Aryan came last. Not that they're special people, uh, they're, they, they're far from that. Uh, the, uh, but they, they had a special uh, purpose, that was the thing. And, and one of them was to bring truth to mankind and not enslave mankind, which is what they did. So, uh, so they uh, turned out to be the ultimate scumbags of, of civilization, actually, you know, as we uh, see the, uh, her, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the legacy that they have left us, you know, of this world domination uh, scheme. So, and, and the abuse, uh, the psychopathic abuse they've levied on everybody. So, uh, so let me go here further. They had little knowledge of calendars. They rely on seasons to mark the passage of time. The sun, moon, and stars were created for days, months, and seasons, but it took man a long time to discover their movements. It took man many centuries before he discovered that the sun is the center of the universe. Um, and, and of course, again, this is only for the primitive because for the Aryan, this was not the case. They, it was all breathed into him, Adam. And he was the he was the bright and shining star. In fact, also known as the star ram and the uh, sovereign. That's where the word sovereign comes from. In the ninth century, after the Moesiach and the Syrian bishop Mar Eshat wrote a book in which he uh, warned the Christians against the teachings of the Chaldean astrologers that the sun is the center of the universe. Um, and, um, yeah, well, we know that the right hand and the left hand were always battling with each other there. Um, and, um, so, and the priesthoods were running the show and the battle. And the Hebrews, uh, followed that the earth was at the center. Of course, that's from the Talmud, right? So, um, the earth is not at the center. The Vatican also claimed that the earth was at the center. Interesting that the, the, the Vatican and the, and the, and the Jewish Talmud are all on the same page with that. And then we have one more, division in the sky. And Yahweh set them in the firmament of the, uh, 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 of the sky to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And Yahweh saw that it was perfect. It was Yahweh, sorry. Actually, it's interesting when I looked up the word good, you know, oh, it was good. You know, it says it several times in the other days as well. Oh, and it was good. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, okay, doesn't that sound like milk toast? You know, come on, good? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I look it up and I find out it's Yaltzar. Yaltzar, whoa! You couldn't ask for a more powerful word. Yal, that which goes round. And Zar, well, the Zar is the word for star. And so so the star that goes round, so everything. And he saw that it was all the produce of the star that goes round is really what it meant. A produce of the light. Production of the light. Light production. Not that it was good, and therefore the, the aspect that being perfect perfect and infinite in resource capability in what it provides for us every day on earth what do we need where cannot we get it you know and oh it's good oh, it was good oh. you know like uh, <laughs> you know, i can't get over it you know what they've done to our scriptures you know and um, oh nice shot there uh, that. Thanks, Desert. And, um, um, I was, I've been hesitating trying, trying out these graphics because I haven't had a um, 
practice run. I've just put them in there, so yeah. You did it. Okay. And that was Genesis one seventeen through eighteen. All that these divisions exist only in the earthly mind. There we go. Only in the earthly mind. Yahweh, who is the great Dole of Haim, that light star right there is a great school of Haim, continually given power, never taking a break. Being the light, uh, the great Dole of Haim being the light, the, the Aceous Spare, the spirit, and the truth from the tree's root. There's the tree's root right there. Sparkling, that's the tree's root. That's the tree of life, that's the tree of knowledge. All in one. Cannot behold anything contrary to its nature. As Ashan grew in wisdom and comprehending, he began to comprehend the nature of the forces around him and the purpose of the creation. What great engineers I've got. This is, you know, you're all going to make me look good here. I can't get over it. There's more. Um, I'm just but waiting. In, in his study, <laughs> But so, in his studies of Yahweh's creation, the great Dole of Haim's creations, or Yahweh's work and walk, he studied everything in relation to himself. We often think of darkness as a evil, and yet only during the dark hours of the night can we find the rest from our toil of the day and see the uh, uh, illustrious works of Yahweh, the stars and the, the planets in the realm of the Asia Spirit, all things are yeah, perfect, good, it says good here again, perfect, Yatsar, because they are all exist of necessity. Well, it was his will that they exist, and so there we go. And that's out of the uh, Old Testament light, now we'll go into New Testament light, um, and uh, you want at least one out of there. I, he's been building up, I, I read one a day, and I've got a, a backlog of them now. And, uh, and, they, and they better answer for us, uh, you know, these things within our uh, shultres. And I better get out of uh, this, and I'll get the, uh, the Siri of Christ real quick, and I'll refer to that uh, again. I did a brief this morning in another good uh, comparison. We've got to do comparisons because we're, we're reading things literally that are not necessarily literal, but are metaphorical, um, and, you know, and um, well, look at these books here. You can read it for yourself. Oh, okay, Ninja, you've been giving them some homework, I can tell. A little bit, okay. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to give you a raise, I, I guess, Thanks. obviously. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Checks in the mail. Okay, yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give you two, uh, yeah. I'm giving <laughs> alms in a secret. Okay, but when you do your alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And that, and that, uh, and that's Matthew 6, 3. And, of course, the... Uh, to me, what that has always meant was, do not let those who are on the left know what you, who are on the right, are doing. Okay, so that's one way of interpreting it. Wow. We don't let those, you know, like your, you wouldn't, you don't let your sister know exactly what I was thinking. On the left, right? Yes, exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yet, so you do everything you do in secret uh, from a benevolent standpoint. Um, uh, other than you, when you gave her the, the hot chocolate, it was over. It was in her face, and, um, <laughs> and she actually yeah. enjoyed it. Oh, I'm quite and proud so, of that move. Yep. Yeah. So you keep <laughs> coals of fire on her head at the same time by doing something nice for her when she doesn't do anything nice for you. Um, and um, so, so there's what I've always perceived, but now I see Lamsa as a another um, way of presenting it here. So let's find out. So let's not. Let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing is an Aramaic idiom, uh, meaning let no one know, not even your wife or and your brother, what you are doing when you give alms. But of course, uh, our, our direct family, if we're in a spiritual family, would not be on the left. But it, but it, so it's just taking to taken to more of an extreme, meaning when you do something, you know, it's it's between you and Yeshua, yeah. the double head, because. Um, the, the, the less anybody knows about it, the more he said he will reward you openly. So, so we can tell uh, our spouse or we can tell our our sister and brother what we are doing. But if we want to do it, things certainly totally private. That's our business uh, when it's on a benevolent scale and it's following the scripture perfectly. And therefore, there's even greater rewards. It, it, it also transforms our character into a greater being at the same time, a benevolent of cre creation. 
Um, so it's following those scriptures, Shul Tzeitz. This is because Yahweh knows and sees the, uh, the perfect action or the good deed even when it is done in secret and therefore there is no need to publish it. It, all, uh, it often happens that the recipient of alms is embarrassed in the community because of the publicity given by the giver. The name of the alms giver is sometimes announced in the, syne- in the synagogue that's putting out the eye of the sun, the temple, and, the, and discussed in the marketplaces. And uh, in Yeshua's day, many rich men gave alms to the poor to attract public recognition of their piety, but this was also done by uh, pagans and by many religious sects. Even today, some religious organizations publish a donor's name in the newspaper and install a plaque in the church in his memory. Some would not give unless they were assured of publicity. Yeshua said, when you give alms, do not blow the trumpet before you. That is, don't go in and out, uh, out announcing and talking about your giving. Your father, your great father, who sees in secret, will reward you for giving. But those who bow, excuse me, those who blow the trumpet have already received the reward. They're blowhards. Therefore, they get nothing from the people. Uh, they receive the reward from the people who praise their names in the synagogue, street corners, and the marketplace. So that's the reward. That's what it means. They got the reward. They got their recognition. They got their little uh, Twinkie, and that's all they're going to get, a little Twinkie in the eye. And, um, yeah, so let me pull this uh, Syrian Christ. So, you know, so the more the more we apply ourselves to the letter of the Scripture, this is when things really start happening within our, our spiritual life. You know, it's not by reading. It's by reading and then acting upon what we read, you see. And that's just like, um, let me just take a sip of your hand. We're going to make her slurping, but it was right up at the rim. Uh, so it's just like, um, you, you know, when we were, we have uh, our parents, you know, they told us, okay, uh, uh, put on that, that coat, put on that jacket, it's cold out there, you know. We go, oh, come on, it's not cold, sure, you put your jacket on. You know, and then, uh, and so we don't, uh, we don't get it till we're adults, and we, then we finally get it. You know, but the same. Um, are you creating this stuff right while we're talking, Ninja, or is this already produced by you? Um, I just uh, found a whole stack of cool graphics and put a few together into the OBS, and this is the first uh, run through I've had of them. I just loaded them up. Oh, and... <laughs> that book that says the breath of a star. Oh uh, yeah. That right now? Okay, this one um, just had that the like the book and the the glitter um, coming to like going to the book. I did the text and the uh, they're snowflakes. <laughs> you did that while we're talking, or did you do that? No, prior to no, the I made it. Been, I made it yesterday and put it in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's fantastic. That is beautiful. Thank you. No worries. For that effort. Yeah, it, uh, I'm sure the, the listeners really appreciate, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, seeing that type of uh, stuff as well. You know, um, so but the point is that we don't, we don't, in the deepness of what much of our scriptures is saying, we yeah. don't fully uh, uh, get it until we do it. We won't get it until we do it, and then and because it's a process, you know, it is a process of yeah. of unfolding, you know. And so, okay, so we're in the. Uh, then we'll take a quick uh, three-minute break again. But we're in the Syrian Christ. And uh, I want to do another read on the tears, because I learned something about the tears a little more than I than I had a better uh, comprehension on. And uh, the tear also here is uh, known as the Zav, the, Zav, uh, the Zavon. I'm sure it was Zay, Zavon, probably. Um, wow. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but here it's Zavon. And I know the, the W is a V, uh, and uh, so but anyway, there would be a silent T in front of the Z. But they're called tares, and in the simple sense, you know, the tares, uh, a weed is a tear. You tear out the weed, and so 
Yeah. That's how I always um, envision that. But yet, apparently, in the east, there is a, um, a type of a grain uh, that is um, directly related to what we call the tear. And so um, I'm getting this uh, here for the first time, and it's uh, rather interesting. So the tear, Siwan, is a grain which, when ground with wheat and eaten, causes dizziness and nausea, a state much like sickness. For this reason, this plant is hated by the Syrians, although they use tares very extensively as chicken feed. Wheat merchants are likely to sell Kamath Mizwen, wheat mixed with tares, in hard times, because they can buy it for less money than pure wheat. I do not think there is a family among the common people of Syria which has not suffered at one time or another from tear sickness. Having tasted the gall of this affliction a few times myself, I do not at all wonder at the Syrians' A belief that tares must have come into the world by the enemy, and that, and what I still remember with both uh, Emerson and uh, sympathy are the heartfelt, withering imprecations which the afflicted ones always shower upon the seller of such tarry wheat when the food had taken real effect on the staggering nauseated members of the family of a family felt compelled to allow nature to take its course. The grasps and groans punctuated uh, by the, um, the regurgitation uh, and then while with added may God destroy his home uh, may the gold turn into dust in his hands. May he spend the price of what he sold us at the funerals of his children and so forth. Do you feel now the force of the allusion to the tares in the parable? So the Ashafans, the servants of the householder, came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow perfect seed in your field? And from where then hath it tares? Does he want? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. Enemies are, of course, always disposed to injure one another, and in an agricultural land like Syria, harm is often done to property for revenge. So the scattering of tares for this purpose is a, in a, uh, excuse me, and so the scattering of tares for this purpose in a newly sown wheat field is not utterly unnatural nor unthinkable. But the reference in the parable is to a, uh, a belief which is prevalent, and I use the word here uh, for the sake of con the uh, context. Yeah which is always prevalent in some districts in Syria to the effect that in spite of all that the sower can do to prevent it, the tares do appear mysteriously in fields where only wheat had been sown. Some dark power introduces the noxious plant, for sure. And that's a, his own uh, interjection here. Uh, of course, in the East, they didn't, you know, uh, when they say, you know, the devil, they just mean it's a, it's a metaphor for it the adversary, which is always man. Man is the adversary. We know that. Uh, there's no question man is involved in all the shenanigans on our planet. Um, and we are the spirits that are running the serpent, you know, the surfboard serpent's running us, depending upon uh, who it is, I guess, right? So, um, some dark powers, okay, so once I listened to a heated controversy on the subject between some Syrian landowners and an American missionary, the landowner clung to the to the belief that tares would appear in a field, even if no tare seed was ever planted in that field. Well, that's that's true because just it's the same with weeds. You know, you don't have to plant weeds; weeds automatically grow, right? So while the son of the West insisted that no such growth could take place without the seed having first been introduced into the field in some natural way, the fight was a draw. The servant said unto him. Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the, the tares, you root up uh, also the wheat with them. The attempt is often made to pull up the hated tares from among the wheat, but in vain. The concluding admonition in the parable may well be taken to heart by every hasty reformer of the type of a certain region.
generator of society, who, who when asked to produce, uh, to proceed slowly, said, the fact is, I am in a hurry, and the great doll of fame is not. Okay. And so, uh, just a, a concluding thought on this, that uh, <clears throat> the, um, you know, the, uh, the idea of the terror and, and not pulling them up because uh, they, symbolically the terrors do represent the, uh, the, uh, the things we're tr attempting to overcome in our life, okay, whatever it is, our, pro our challenge is, whatever we can, you know, uh, conquer. And so the terrors are those things that go, so he said, let them grow up together. And so while some are able to have the, uh, the weeds or the terrors pulled out of their life, at the time of uh, going through the waters of purification, let's say. Uh, others uh, then found that they are in a great struggle in attempting to overcome. And, um, and, it, and it says that uh, let them grow together. And then at the harvest, and the harvest is when you receive the great breath of the wind and fire, when you are harvested from this earth as a spirit, when you are uh, the proverbial Lazarus come forth, then um, uh, that's when the harv the, uh, the tares are thrown into, into the fire, okay? So this is, um, again, we are, need to know these uh, different metaphysical aspects of our salvation, soul motivation story, uh, because nobody ever defines them. And therefore, it's for, for most people, it's impossible to know where you are in the story, because none of these things are properly defined. In fact, the words have been, of course, altered, put on the sacred altar, uh, of, of the Western Vatican, and um, and, and, and uh, the words changed in the College of Abbreviators outside the Vatican, uh, run by the Jesuit Curie, because they put the cure in your eye, and that mud, that uh, proverbial sound mud we were seeing yesterday on the other uh, program. So, um, so yeah, we have a uh, you know a lot to, uh, to uh, define, and the one that comes to, to you know to uh, meaning, which is one of the most significant meanings that was stolen from us. Right there, when he comes up out of the water, the water's purification, which he had to do. He, well, he wait a minute, you know, John, y'all going to own the, the Alvavataser, John the Baptist said, so wait a minute, I, you're going to be uh, Alvavatasered by me? I need to be Alvavatasered by you. What's going on? He says, uh, well, endure it for now, because it is, it is required for us to, and it doesn't even say this correctly, it is required us, for us to fulfill the perfection. To, ful to fulfill the, the perfection of creation. You see, that's really what he said there. Was, and so he, even Yeshua, had to do it because he was our, our elder brother. He was our forerunner. He, as, a, as an Ashan, as flesh and blood, had to do the same thing. He became like us so that we could become like him and the great breath of the wind and fire and the Holy Spirit. And so, so he says we need to do this. So when he does it, he comes up out of the water, then all of a sudden a voice comes through the clouds. And a, and a window in the clouds is parted open and the light focuses down directly on him. Just picture him being in the water alone while everyone else is on the shore. And he's there all by himself and the, the light is focusing on him while he's praying, you know, creating light and uh, giving thanks, uh, just coming up out of the water. And then the light focuses on him with the brightness of a dove, with the, folk, with the focus of an eagle and the brightness of a dove is the way it would have said it in the original. And um, focus of an eagle brightness of the dove, the white dove, and, uh, and he says, this is my, uh, said, this is my beloved son, uh, in whom I am well pleased, hear him, but it actually, it said this is the, one of the biggest rip-offs of all of them, because it's relevant to knowing who he is and who we, uh, versus who we are in the world, and it said, this is my only love seed, my only love seed, not beloved, beloved is a code for my only love seed, hear him, okay, so, so if we want to be only loved, and we have to be in him, the only loved seed, he is the pure seed line. Okay, so we have to put off, put off the corruptions and the tears, and we have to put on the purity of life that is, we find in the Asia of Wars, in the, in the, um, you know, in the, in the uh, Shofar, the book, the Soul Fire. Okay, so there you go. Uh, Angel, well, let's go to a break, and, um, and take, let's take five minutes if we can, and then we'll be back with some more. I'm going to do uh, the next coming up. We're going to do uh, uh, go into the Sumer Aryan Dictionary. I'm going to read a little bit of that introduction on the profound nature of uh, what um, we're being denied in all of the other uh, uh, scholastics and dictionaries are uh, the Aryan history 
which is relevant. Doesn't matter whether we're Aryan or not; it's still relevant uh, history, and we have to um, hear some things we've not heard before. Okay, and um, okay. Well, yeah, I'm loving this. Loving it. Scriptures, yeah, yeah, we got more. Okay, uh, so we'll go to a quick break. Um, turn your music up, Desert, while you while you're having a break, because I want to see if you like this uh, flute oh, music. Okay. <laughs> since oh, since I've got that warning about the other one, so I've put some new one, put a new one on. Um, okay. Oh, okay, we'll be right back after the break, guys. Uh, oh, hang on, I just see something in the chat. Shelley, g'day. Um, how's it going? And thank you. I was I was playing around. Um, I'm not. Uh, I haven't mastered the the texting, the writing the text in the OBS yet, but um, yeah, I had a bit of a play around and I'm I'm trying them out. Uh, I didn't even get to practice, so so this is the first uh, run with the new graphics. <laughs> um, yeah, bit of a spruce up. Anyway, uh, we'll go to a short break, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Forbidden History Chronicles with Ninja Cat 111 